So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September the 22nd, and this is Back at Beekeeping. Questions and answers episode number 225. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So thank you for being here. Guess what tomorrow is, by the way? Saturday the 23rd. What do you care about that? Uh, autumnal, autumnal, autumnal equinox. I don't know how to say it. But anyway, last day of summer. Summer's over. That's right. No matter what the weather's doing, it's time to start being sad because fall is coming. Fall is here. So anyway, um, what can we talk about? If you want to know what we talk about today, please look down in the video description and you'll see all the topics listed in order. There will also be links available to you so that you can find out more about some of the things that are talked about or mentioned. How do you submit your own question? You go to the website, The Way To Be. Dot org and click on the page titled The Way to Be, fill out the form, and voila, you submit your topic for consideration. I did not get to all of the topics submitted, and that's because I have limited time. So this week coming up, uh, well today, the inspector is going to show up. That's right. And by inspector, I mean somebody who just turned eight years old. My grandson, we're pulling honey. Yesterday we put uh, escape boards on, and uh, today we're removing the supers that are on top of those escape boards. So there you have it. He's on his way. Things are happening. We're taking advantage of the warm weather. What else is going on? Speaking of warm weather, how warm is it outside? 68.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 20 degrees Celsius. It's not very windy. Two mile an hour winds. This is perfect beehive working temperature, and these are perfect conditions. No rain in the forecast. There's a chance of rain, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to get here. 58% relative humidity. Bees are bearding. Bees are on the landing boards. Bees are venting their hives. All great signs because they're still filling out the remaining honeycomb and still building comb in some cases, especially when it comes to new hives, newly hived swarms of bees and things like that. Let's see. Saturday, tomorrow will be the warmest. So those of you who are in the northeastern United States or the state of Pennsylvania, look to tomorrow to be your day to work your bees. It's going to be the very best. But the good news is three days after that, still in the high 60s, which means 
in the sunshine, it will be even better than that. So hopefully your beehives are not in the shade. Air quality, it's good, it's great. We're in the green zone. I don't know what's going on with the fire status up in Canada, but uh, things are okay right now. And uh, my grandson, as I mentioned, was here yesterday. And just to give you a little clue about some of the cool things that happen inside the beehives, and by the way, lots of cool stuff going on. You wanna see more than you normally do? Bring a young beekeeper in with you who just is excited to look at every single hive and get in there. And what did he see? Vespa crabro. What's that? That's a European hornet. So the European hornet, uh, by the way, is the largest hornet that we have around. Nobody cares about Vespa mandarinia anymore. That's northwestern United States. They're not even spotting that. It's not around. Now, there's some other hornet on the scene that people are talking about elsewhere, but this is the cool one. Vespa crebro. So uh, what happened was we were pulling the supers apart and there it was inside the hive. What condition do you think it was in? Well, the bees had killed it. I don't know how they killed it. I don't know if they clustered around it and superheated it and killed it the way some of the relatives of Apis mellifera are capable of doing. But uh, they couldn't drag it out of the hive. It's too big. So they killed it and then they just entombed it with what else? Propolis. So it was really cool. And I did not have my cell phone on me, so we did not get photos or video. But I'm just sharing with you. It was pretty impressive. So let's get right into it. I don't know anything else to tell you about before we get started. So I guess this is it. This is also a podcast, so don't forget. Just Google The Way to Be Podcast and you'll find it. It's hosted by Podbean, but it's been picked up by seven other podcast companies. So that's good news, and I want to thank you for being here. So let's get rolling. The first question comes from Terry, the noob beekeeper. That's uh, the YouTube channel name. I have robber screens on as there seems to be a lot of robbing bees trying to rob. Is three by three eighths of an inch enough to protect from robbing? My bees are having a hard time removing dead drones because they have to lift them up to get them past the robbing screen. The bees are strong in numbers. It's hard to find info on when to remove robbing screens or how long to have them on. I live in the southeast Canada, southeast of Canada, 40 kilometers from the USA border near Ogdensburg. Thanks in advance for any suggestions. Okay. Well, I don't have robbing screens on any of my hives right now. And that's because nectar flow is still going on. It's pretty strong. So the bees are otherwise occupied. That's the good news. But of course, that's going to come to an end. And that's why at the end of every one of my Q&As this time of year, I caution people to start reducing entrances. And if you didn't catch my video, I posted a video yesterday where I just walked around very cursory and I looked at all the landing boards. I also pointed out differences in some of the entrances and those that are open and those that are narrow. And keep in mind that some of my entrances on my landing boards are wide open. That's because I make comparisons. And they're not just comparisons regarding hive defense, but for example, does a larger entrance result in more honey production? Does a larger entrance, which gives your bees access to the entire width of the landing board, does that make them more productive? Or is it more of a challenge? Because here's the trade-off and food for thought. Okay. So I've been keeping bees since 2006. Uh, I've said this to people in the past too, that if you make a change to your beehives and you change all of your beehives at once, how on earth are you supposed to compare and know whether something is working or isn't? Now, I realize if you only have one or two beehives, your opportunity to make these comparisons is much reduced. More hives, more statistics, and over an extended period of time, too. So year after year after year, this is why record keeping is really important. And one of the perceptions that it seems right, you know, if you had a wide open landing board and a fully populated hive, um, you would assume that they would have more honey and resources inside the large opening hive as compared to those that follow the standard that I've kind of come up with on my own for myself, three-eighths of an inch high up to a three-inch width. So I just want to explain a little bit about why and how I came up with that opening size. So first of all, the three-eighths inch height 
There are no mammals in North America, even the little pygmy shrew, that can get in as an adult through that opening. So then I don't need mouse guards. I bring this up because this is coming up. We're facing winter soon. Those of you who are in the Northern Hemisphere, I realize. Now here's the thing. Um, so the other part of it is people frequently say, yeah, but I want maximum honey production. I want better air movement. I want them to be able to dry out the honey quicker, cap it off and everything else. It seems to make sense. Bigger opening, better venting, more bee production because there's no impedance of the bees coming in or going out of the hive and uh, it should be fantastic, right? There's virtually no difference in the small. I even have the hives that have just a little hole, three quarter inch hole. Uh, we have the hives that have a three eighths, in, three eighths of an inch height and across the width, uh, full width for eight or 10 frame, standard Langstroth style uh, brood box. And of course we narrow them down. I have some that have that three eighths inch height, but they're only three and in, three inches in width. And uh, honey production is no different from what we can tell. So the narrow entrance, here's the other part of that. Now, let me throw another monkey wrench into it too. So that's not entirely true that there's no difference in honey production, but hive configuration also plays. So I'll say this, that the vertical hives, so the narrow footprint, tall hives, so we're talking about nucleus style hives, but there are a number of companies and I added a third company to my observation yard for lack of a better word for it. Um, we have the five frame deep nuke. So all of these hives are deeps, right? So we have a five frame nuke, six frame lysin nuke, and then the seven frame apame nucleus hives. And then what happens is we have a narrow footprint, but so now we expand them up quicker, right? So when we talk about a 10 frame deep standard Langstroth hive, um, what you have there is basically two nukes if we were five to five and you just stacked them one on top of the other. So the comparison between the Langstroth single deep 10 frame box and the nucleus hive two five frame boxes, one directly above the other, and that tiny round entrance. Now you have an option. You can set those up with a full width, you know, five frame entrance on that, but I don't. Mine have just the little circle entrance, which is up off the bottom of the hive. They outperform the single deep by a lot. So configuration plays more so than the entrance size. So that's the second part of it. So the other thing is, um, what are we doing? The comment here is that it's a strong colony. There's lots of bees in it and that the bees are showing some difficulty in getting up and over the uh, robbing screens. So let's talk about robbing screens real quick. This is a robbing screen. If you've been keeping bees for any amount of time, you've probably seen these. This is basically the standard robbing screen. This is by Bee Smart Designs. And uh, it's all it says, Be Smart Designs. Okay. And then this one is by Cirocell. It's also a robbing screen. And I want to talk about the design of both of them. The robbing screen, by the way, from Cirocell is very smooth. So when the bees climb up it, they're going to have to engage their feet in the little pads and they're going to walk up this. And then you can open or close one side or the other or both of them. And of course, what's being described in the video here is the bees come out, undertaker bees are trying to get rid of bees that are dying or dead inside the hive, or they're just throwing out drones, which are overweight, by the way, and they'll drag them up here and then they have to, with a lot of effort, get them out the top. So there's no question that having this off of your hive is much easier when the bees are withdrawing dead bees, detritus, things like whatever they're trying to get out of the hive, easier not to have to scale another barrier, right? But there are differences between these two. This one's nice and smooth. I really like the design of it. This comes with screws, tabs that you can cut off to adapt it to an eight or 10 frame. I believe the Blythewood Bee Company sells these. But if you look at the uh, Bee Smart designs, first of all, you have to use screws to mount this one because the holes that mount are here. Screws come with it. This one comes with push pins at the top. So they're already here, they're organized, and you just pull out the push pins and push this on the hive when you need them, in a pinch, in a hurry. 
because this also nests inside the Mi Smart Designs insulated inner cover. But the thing too is on the inside of this, it's uh, roughed up. So the bees get their footing maybe a little better. I can't say that I can look at these two and see that a bee gets up this one quicker or easier with a, a drone or whatever they're trying to get rid of than they do on this one. But I'm saying that there's some feature considerations here where this one has more texture on it. And just as this one opens on either side, this one also has openings. They're a little smaller and this is where the bees are gonna haul up and get through. The whole thing about this is when the robbers come, they're following a scent. So see the little holes through here? They follow the scent right to this point and look how this area where the entrance is that the bees are gonna use, the resident colony, um, there are no holes up here because we're not gonna lead the robbers that are here sniffing all the honey in there that they're trying to get, and that's hornets or other bees. Uh, they don't tend to follow this very quickly because there's no way for the scent to penetrate there. That's a very good design feature. Where if you look at these, where the entrance is, they can smell right through here, plus light passes through. So this is pretty much opaque. But the light passes through on the serial cell version, and uh, they would eventually find their way up here because the venting, the scent trail, goes all the way right next to where the entrance and exit is. So there are considerations, but the question here is, do you need to put them on, first of all, now it's already on, but I would say for a really strong colony that does not have the full width open, you don't need an entrance, uh, a robbing screen like this. Uh, the point is prevention is worth more, you know, than trying to fix it later once a robbing frenzy starts. I don't know if you've been around once some of these bees late in the year get a taste of honey when you're inspecting a hive or you're pulling supers and things like that. And I'll get to this at the fluff section at the very end, why we're pulling supers now in the middle of a nectar flow instead of at the end of it. So that's coming up. But the thing is, uh, if it's a strong colony and as described here, you have a three by three eighths inch opening, um, I'd say that you're good to go without a robin screen. And, uh, but you have to have careful observation of your bees. And if it's a strong colony, they can defend themselves. All of my colonies, even the ones with really wide uh, landing boards are defending themselves fine. Even on the cold mornings when the yellow jacket wasps show up and try to get in, I had one colony that they were getting in. And I have since put, put uh, number nine or number eight screen, stainless steel screen on the front. I used hot glue, tacked it on there. Because hot glue really doesn't work very well, even that's, though it's uh, designed or claimed to be used outdoors in the weather. It's really a temporary tab, so just the hot glue puts it on really quick. And then later when you're done, just pull them off. So it's very easy to do. And you can reattach them because the hot glue stays embedded in the screen. And then all you do is reheat the hot glue that's embedded in the screen and it retacks onto the hive entrance that you want to do. So that's just a quick thing that I do. And they recovered and they're defending themselves. And the yellow jackets, they're not giving up though. They're checking the sides underneath your hives, everything else. I don't have one here. Cirocell has a bottom board design that has a wasp trap built into the bottom of it. So if you look up the Cirocell bottom boards, you'll see that there's a translucent trap in the bottom so that it's designed to interrupt robbers because they're the ones that are coming at the back door, the side of the hive, underneath and inspecting everything and they'll go into this trap and then you just pull the tray out and you check it so you find wasps in it uh, so that's interesting they've got some other stuff going on but when to take off robbing screens uh, when the pressure subsides so i know that's kind of dumb but here's the thing uh, all over the country people are under different levels of pressure from being robbed so it depends how many other bees are in your apiary how strong is the colony because the ones that really need to do, be defended are your late season swarm, you know, hiving. So when you've collected a swarm anytime, you know, after July, if they haven't had time to build up, they are really prone to being robbed. Here's another thing. The honeybees themselves are very good at sensing the status of a colony of bees. So when they fly in and they land on the landing board and they're smelling it, because everything is led by pheromones when it comes to honeybees. 
And this is very interesting because you need to know the status of your hives. And by that, I mean, are they queen right? Late season swarms are a disaster. And here's why. You get another swarm. Okay, so then you hive them. So now you're, you think you're expanding your apiary. But you have to think about this time of year, September 23rd, if you have a swarm on a tree and you hive it, you know, you put it in a nuke or something like that, huge challenge ahead of that because you have to continually feed them. They have to have a small hive that they can fortify quickly and then hopefully insulate it enough through the top and sides even in some cases so that you can get them through winter. And I've successfully had September swarms get through winter. But let's think of the bigger picture. The colony that they came out of is right now replacing their queen. So in other words, a swarm happened, swarms generally happen just before a new queen emerges from the queen cell. So we have to look at the calendar and think about what's going on with that hive. Because the queen's gonna emerge, she's not ready to mate yet. She has to mature, she has to be fed, she has to exercise a little bit, and then she's gonna fly out maybe sometime at the end of next week and mate with drones. Drone numbers are declining, although there are plenty of drones right now. So if there is some queen that's making a mating flight, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna find bees to mate with. Okay, drones, which are male honeybees. That's their purpose. They pass on their genetics. So anyway, she flies back, occupies the hive. Let's say she starts laying right away end of the first week of October. Where are we at? At the end of the first week in October, she's laying eggs that's great, but when are the adults emerging? So you have to go 21 days past that. Now think about what time of year. We're, we're on the threshold of November by then. So here in the northeastern United States, that's a disaster. You have a colony that's really in trouble right there, and those are the colonies. That's why I bring it up. The pheromone is different in a colony that either has a young unmated queen, no queen present, or... Uh, a queen that hasn't been uh, really well established, which means the brood scent is way down. Those are open to robbing because guess what, uh, what else is happening? And a lot of people don't talk about this, but this ties right into the observations that I've been making about pheromone attraction, colony to colony. There are bees in a colony that do not have a queen right situation that will be leaving that hive and joining other hives in pretty significant numbers. So it's not just the fact that for the next 21 days after she's been mated and once she's in production, that they're just using resources in the hive to get this brood going. So they're consuming resources, you're losing foragers because they're just joining other colonies and this happens in significant numbers. So you've got a hive that's in decline, those are the ones you know, long story short, those are the ones that are um, going to be robbed. And that's why if you've got weak colonies, if you can determine which one swarmed, combine it with a queen right colony as soon as you can figure out which one that was. So you take these uh, robbing screens off when uh, the nights start freezing. So when it drops into the low 30s and uh, gets into the 20s, and we're talking Fahrenheit here, uh, that's when you're going to have beehives that uh, will be more into self-conservation. They won't be able to send out a lot of foragers. Remember, they don't generally forage until it's in the high 50s, low 60s. So again, when days are consistently only going to be forecast to be in the 50s, for example, you can take your robin screens off because they can't put enough bees into the field to make those assaults on the weaker hives. So... But for the reasons I just described, you could be facing disaster with those colonies no matter what happens, even if they don't get robbed. And uh, just first thing to check, see if it's queen right. Question number two comes from Francine, Sydney, New South Wales. Sad news. Over here in Australia, we have now gone to management plan for the Varroa mite. I know this has nothing to do with your video, but just wanted to ask what treatments you would recommend for our weather in Sydney. The bees have a decent amount of brood in the winter and can forage all year long. We also leave the flow supers on in winter. I did purchase the queen excluder cages with drone frames and will use them to test the drones. 
Okay, so for Francine and a lot of other people that are there in Australia and things are shifting when it talks to or addresses the Varroa destructor mite that's making its way around. Um, I don't think it's it's I don't think it's very helpful for me to make a recommendation about what you should treat with because I don't know what's approved for you. And I also don't understand how your agriculture is, you know, broken down or what your regions are, um, because these are things that are going to be decided in Australia by those people who are making decisions. So here in the United States, um, what I in personally use uh, was not even approved for a really long time in the United States. Uh, it took a while to get approved because there's a process. Again, I don't even know what your process is to qualify something as a miticide. So you're in your kind of infancy as far as control goes. Um, so my thing to suggest here would be because you do have these cages for drone frames and things like that. So that is um, a form of integrated pest management. So one of the things that uh, we would use, which is not a treatment, by the way, it's a, it's a management practice that helps you remove varroa destructor mites. And since you already have the equipment, I'll explain that one. And that is that you have a queen um, isolation cage, which also works for drones. And this is something that I discussed with a new researcher here in the United States that made the observation that uh, the, Varro, the Varro destructor mite was actually attracted to the bodies of male honeybees. So the drones were actually attracting the Varro destructor mites to their bodies. And so I suggested to Dr. Lamas, who did the research, um, that you could be using the queen isolation cage as a drone isolation cage, because if a queen can't get through it, drones can't either. So then we have these drone frames. And somebody else wrote me this week that they have troubles finding drone-sized foundation in Australia. And you know what occurred to me there? No great surprise because Australia hasn't needed that as an integrated pest management practice because they haven't had the varroa destructor mite. So now that you have them, that's kind of something to look for. It's distinctive, they're green, and they're green so that you don't make the mistake of thinking it's worker foundation. So the purpose of that is to have your drones, your drone cells constructed on that frame. And of course, have your queen lay her drone eggs in there, which are non-fertile eggs. And uh, so that's how the males are developed. And the queen decides that based on the size of the cell that she's going to lay in. So then once you have them and they start to develop, the varroa destructor mite is attracted to the drone cells and the developing drone larvae. But they don't go in there until they're about to be capped. So when they get on those uh, developing larvae at the point of their entering the pupa state, which is when they get capped over, that's when the foundress mite, it's called, is going to scoot in there. And then she's going to do her reproduction on those frames. And by having them in a cage, you know when those eggs were laid, you know when uh, the drones were in production, and you've got a lot of time to play with there because the drones take the longest time to actually pupate, which means that once they're all capped on both sides of that frame, you don't need to leave them in there any longer because you've got your mites. So then you can pull the drone frame out and you can just put it in the freezer. And if you've got, I know that in Australia, I think you call them chooks, but if you've got chickens or something that you can feed them to, that's great. If not, you can just clean them up. Maybe wild birds will even eat them. Somebody told me that they've uh, kind of train their wild birds in the area, especially woodpeckers and uh, things like that, to eat the drone uh, pupa after they've been through a freeze cycle. That's interesting to me. So if you can cycle it back to your wild birds and things like that, but what you've done is you've taken a whole bunch of varroa destructor mites out of circulation without having to wait for an approved miticide in your region. So I'm much more comfortable explaining integrated pest management practices than I am trying to recommend a treatment or a miticide that may never even be approved in your country. So I don't know how that goes. So the drones, you know, once they've been in there for 12 or 13 days or 14 days after the eggs are laid and they're all capped over and you've got, that's thousands of them. You can pull them out and you may have, you have 
effectively knock down your mites without a loan, chemical free. The other part of that is uh, screen bottom boards. Screen bottom boards, I don't know what your hive configuration is. I don't know if you're using standard lengths. A lot of people are using flow hives. The flow hive is already built well for it. They have a, an aluminum screen on the bottom that's built in. They have a removable tray. So you can put things in that removable tray. I used to put mineral oil in there. It never dries out. Anything that drops into it dies and the mineral oil is clear. So you get to see in great detail what has dropped in there. Because if you just leave the trays empty with no mineral oil in them, uh, the Varroa destructor mites can drop in, but they're mobile. They scoot around. They're little arachnids. They have eight legs. And so they scoot around and uh, they can get back out. So your job then is to put something in there and those trays are compartmentalized so that the mites, when they drop in, they're stuck. And so now you can find out, do you even have mites? Because that's a passive mite control. And uh, I believe it was Dr. Ellis at University of Florida that said 15% of your mite population can be controlled passively just by having screen bottom boards. And then this is key, some sort of trapping and holding system under your screen. So the flow hive is already custom made for that. It's ready to go. Um, so those are things that I recommend. You've already got these cages, you're in. And so once, of course, you get the comb drawn out because the beeswax is a critical investment on the part of your bees. So then you can just, because you don't have a break year round. So that's one thing that works. Now, another end to that, and this is really for advanced beekeepers. You cannot miss this cycle because here's what happens frequently. Beekeepers think they have more time than they do. So you put in these drone frames, the, they do everything they're supposed to do. The bees follow suit, you know, the queen lays her eggs in there. You've got drones developing, and, uh, but they just forget to pull out the frame. So then what you have is really drone breeding. So mark it on your calendar. And the reason I say that you've got, you know, a lot of time to do that, they have the longest pupa cycle. So you will have many days of opportunity to get in there and take care of that. Now on the flip side of that, a lot of people will say, hey, I've got great genetics. I don't want to take out all of my drones. Well, yeah, they're not going to lay all of their drones on that frame. So in other words, you'll have drone cells elsewhere in your hive as well. And uh, so this just takes out one frame. That company that makes that frame holder, uh, which is sold in the United States at Better Bee, uh, the Queen Isolation Cages, they also make a, oh, why am I talking about it? They make a double. This is one right here. So they make a double frame version. So you can put two frames of drone in here, drone foundation. And then you've really, I don't have a lot of colonies that produce two frames. So that's probably overkill, but uh, you have an isolation opportunity. You can also force a brood break, but since we're not talking about miticide treatments, creating a brood break is what I would do here in order to give them a Varroa treatment. So that would be with oxalic acid vaporization because now the only place that I have reproduction going on is on that frame that's in the cage, that's controlled. I take that out, sacrifice those bees, freeze them. And then uh, the rest of the hive, we can of course treat with oxalic acid, which then gives us 96% effectiveness. So, but again, it's not approved yet. So I don't know who your decision makers are, but there you go. There's a couple of ways that you can control that. Now, if you're really gonna watch your calendar carefully, wait for those drones to emerge from their cells. And because it's a queen excluder, the worker bees can get in and out because the worker bees need to attend to the drones because drones can't take care of themselves. And they have to be fed by the nurse bees. So all of that can go on. But here's the thing, because people will be saying, well, then if the nurse bees get in there to feed those newly emerged drones that are trapped in this cage, won't they be passing Varroa destructor mites that just came out of that cell? And wouldn't those then get onto the nurse bees because those are the ones feeding the drones? That's good thinking. But here's the other part of Dr. Zach Lamas's study. The Varroa destructor mites actually have a preference even over the nurse bees for two to three day old drones. 
So in other words, it says two to three days. Well, what happens in the first day? Well, during the first day of emergence, they may be over here with the brood areas where your workers are, and they may be on the bodies of your nurse bees. But they will scoot off of the bodies of the nurse bees in favor of the bodies of the drones because drones have been fed more. They have more fat stores in their body, which is what the varroa destructor mites feed on. And so that is key too. But there again, now we're using them as a magnet. So after they've emerged, they collect more varroa destructor mites on their bodies. Then you pull the frame out like really quick and get them out of there and freeze them. Kill all those mites. You're also killing the drones. It's just a matter of how much control you want to have. So, and again, this is all contingent upon whether you even have mites. You may not have them yet. So food for thought, plan ahead, have some cages, have some, because the other thing is, it's a benefit to have screen bottom boards anyway with removable trays underneath in an enclosed system. It works anyway, so you'll be ready when the mites actually hit. So that's it. Long answer for a short question. Question number three comes from Steve, Santa Clarita, California. When feeding my bees, typically using a cell top feeder for syrup or pollen patties on top of the frames, which bees are retrieving resources? Nurse bees or foragers? Am I limiting the number of foragers that leave the hive because they aren't foraging inside the box? Or am I, in effect, increasing the number of bees collecting resources since bees that aren't typically foraging are collecting resources too? Okay, so a lot of you are probably scratching your heads wondering what's that about. All right, so here's the cool part. Honeybees are efficient. They're extremely efficient. So they don't waste steps. I don't know if you've ever been in a company that's had an efficiency review before. I've had one of those. It is really annoying and they evaluate every step that someone does to accomplish a task. And this is where you end up with things like, hey, you could be doing that program with 1.6 personnel. And I just thought, who's that 0.6 person? Anyway, moving on. Bees are efficient. So what happens? Let's look at what happens when bees are foraging, right? So the forager comes in, let's say it's a nectar and pollen forager which a lot of plants, a lot of flowers offer nectar and pollen. Some offer only nectar, some offer only pollen, but let's combine them. So that forager flies in and they're taking advantage of daylight right now. We've got sunlight, we are at peak, it is 1.51 in the afternoon and I guarantee you it sounds like a swarm in the apiary. They are zinging as fast as they can go. They don't have time to play games. They are getting every ounce of nectar and pollen out of the environment that they can while they can and when they fly into the hive they go to the dance floor and they do their waggle dance and they contribute and they let everybody know where the resource is they, they provide samples you'll see bees following them and sticking their proboscis out and the bee that has brought that resource in they lick it and they find out that it's good and they want it and then that means more foragers go to that location and there's a lot of information being spread around, but that forager wants to get right back out there and in the action. They don't have time to mamby-pamby around with putting the stuff in cells for long-term storage. And I'm talking about nectar. So they're storekeeper bees. That's what I call them. I don't know what they're really called, but storekeeper bees are bees that haven't left the hive yet. They are inside workers. And their whole job is to take their, their shipping and receiving. So they are receiving. So here comes that truck, which is the bee that's been foraging. It lands at the landing dock, which is the dance floor. And they, you'll see bees stick their tongue out and they'll take the resources from that bee. And then they'll scoot on up above and then they'll go and store those resources in the cells that need to be stored. So beyond that, then the bee that's got the pollen on it, they don't waste time with that either because they don't care about the storekeeper bees. Not only that, what's closest to the entrance, the brood. So this is interesting. The brood is close by, so the bread making operations, bee bread, the protein that they feed the baby bees with, those are very near the entrance too. So this is actually pretty efficient that the bee that comes in with pollen on its legs goes over to a cell, gets all itchy and starts rubbing its legs together and it scratches off the pollen into those cells. It doesn't stick around to pack them down. It doesn't stick around to start to process them even though it has already mixed it with some nectar or some honey, whatever it carried with it for energy while it was out foraging. That forager is back in action. So it does dances, unloads its cargo, back out foraging so long as it's daylight. 
Inside the hive, you have the storekeeper bees that take the resource if it's nectar, and they're the ones who go up and start putting that in the cells. If they come across, uh, usually it's nurse bees that do this, but if they come across freshly deposited pollen, and when you look at those um, cells that have the little pollen balls in it, bees almost immediately come by and stick their heads in there and start jamming it in. They're also mixing it up. They're adding to it, and they're going to make sure that it ferments, and it does that in the next 48 hours. So all this production is going on inside the hive. And the reason is, are the foragers that are out and about shifting gears when they're stuck inside. So when they get inside, those are the ones that you'll see by the hundreds, if not thousands, collected up above. They'll be on the front, they'll be bearding. Those are unemployed foragers. The workers that are doing the storekeeping work inside, that are drying the honey and everything else, are still inside doing that work. That does not change even in wintertime, so when you're feeding them. And uh, you've got workers that are indoor workers and outdoor workers, okay. Let's talk about when they cluster up, who's on the outside mantle of the cluster, whose bodies are just there generating warmth and they're helping to keep things kind of, they're physically, uh, they're like mobile insulation for lack of a better word. The bees insulate themselves. So now when they need water or something else, because in the middle of that cluster in winter time, this is just how I'm going to explain it. Um, we have nurse bees in there and we have fat bodied winter bees. So these fat bodied winter nurse bees live longer than the worker bees do at any other time of the year. So during a period of dearth, so not just a winter bee, but any period of dearth, um, if they can sense it coming, they'll produce these fat bodied bees. They don't forage, they don't leave the hive, and they stay right inside. And their job is to provide nutrition and resources for the skeleton crew. In other words, for small clusters of brood that will continue that hive into the following spring. They stay in the center of the mantle and they're protected by the older bees. Now when they need honey, let's say, the entire cluster gradually moves over honey that's stored. That's what they're storing right now. So as they move along, these foragers are the ones that are tearing open the covers. In other words, capped honey. They're tearing through the bees wax. They're getting that resource and they're bringing it into the brood area and they're feeding through trophallaxis the bees that are inside the hive that don't leave. So it is still the foragers inside the hive at nighttime, for example, uh, at, at times when there is no forage outside. So it's too cold to forage. Maybe it's raining all day. The foragers do get activated inside and will access what's in your your hive top feeder, they will go into the long-term storage, the honey stores and things like that. And then when it's too cold to spread out, because this happens inside the hive too, it can be too cold for them to spread out and access resources. So the ones that are burning themselves out first are the foragers inside the hive. There are even water bees inside the hive, and that's a specialty because they're all. if you're a water bee, you no longer go to a cell that's got stored honey and feed that. They don't mix the two together. So then the water bees leave this mantle and they're the ones that'll lick the condensation off the interior side walls of the hive. This is very critical for winter survival for your bees. And then they will move back through the cluster and then they will pass that water off to as many other bees as they encounter. But of course the critical bees that get supplied like that will be the nurse bees and those attending to brood. And of course the queen is always attended to. In fact, the last bee that's going to die in your hive, if it gets to that point, is going to be the queen and her retinue, which are the bees that attend to her. So even inside the hive, the foragers that would normally be leaving the hive are the ones gathering and bringing resources in. Here's another example of that, which is pretty cool. If you have thermal scans, I know a lot of you don't, but over the brood area, sometimes you'll see little empty cells in the middle of the capped brood. And sometimes you'll see one worker bee in the middle of one of those cells. And this is very, again, efficient. And that's because its thorax heats up really hot, well into the 80s, high 80s. And they do this for a long time, like 30 minutes, 20 minutes. And then they burn themselves out. And then they go cool again. And when they do that, that one backs out and another one goes in and starts to heat that. Because when they're in that cell, they're, they're heating six other cells and they're keeping them from what's called chilled brood, brood that gets too cold and the pupa actually die. 
So even though they're capped, they don't need to be fed anymore, but they need to be warmed and retained so that they don't die from the cold. So while they're there, they back out. And I'll give you an example of a forager job inside the hive. That bee that's been heating its thorax and burning itself out and running its motors hot without fanning its wings, uh, when they back out, another bee comes through the mantle and goes up to it and through trophallaxis passes on the carbohydrates that that bee needs. So it could be water that it's receiving because it needs water to survive, or it could be the carbohydrate, which is the stored honey in wintertime. So they need both of those things to survive. So water bees can bring water to them. And then, of course, stored honey is brought to them also. And then they trade back and forth and they're generating heat inside the hive. So it's cool stuff. So no, you are not taking foragers out of the field when you have resources in the hive that are going to be fed. So these different things are going on. Uh, the nurse bees are not taken off of their task. And I hope I explained that in a coherent way. Question number four. This comes from Hunt Lady. Had two Italian hybrid queens in their respective hives, both of which swarmed this spring, and the yellow marked queens stayed with the hive. Now, however, both of these hives are weakened by tiny red ants. I think I finally have that under control. Thank you for the gel toothpaste tip. As I suggested gel toothpaste on the stand legs. But neither hive will survive this winter as is. Can I put an inner cover with a round hole between them and combine the hives? I have no wish to lose either queen. And so here's what I'm going to say. Um, because combining hives without losing either queen, that means you have to keep them separate. When you do that, you need double screen boards. So in other words, we've got this, let's call it a 10 frame deep. And then the other hive we want to put on top of it, another 10 frame deep. And then between the two, we have this divider board. That divider board needs double screens because they can't be in physical contact. If they're in physical contact, they start to spread queen pheromones to one another and then one of the queens is going to be rejected and killed, and it can be killed by workers. It doesn't have to be queen to queen combat, although that can happen too. But the problem with it that I see, and of course this is a decision that people will make their own bee management. If you're gonna combine the two, my suggestion is the uh, strongest colony goes on the bottom, but if we've got these screens, and we also need an extra um, exit for those bees. So now we've got bees benefiting from the warmth. It's kind of like you're in an apartment building and you got the top apartment. In the wintertime, you benefit by passive heat from the apartments that are below you. So you pay lower utilities. But here's the thing. Now that bottom group has to generate more heat because they have a continual heat loss up into the upper cavity. Uh, and I don't know if this is really the full scope of the question because it says, can I put an inner cover with a round hole between them and combine the hives? If you do that, and you can, you can combine them. If you do that, you're not going to keep both queens. So, which, by the way, is what I personally would recommend, combine the hives. But now we don't need a board between them. We can just put newsprint between them. The most productive colony on the bottom, The if there's any lower status of one of the colonies, that one goes on top and then let them go through the newsprint, which they do pretty darn quick, by the way. And you can spritz the newsprint a little bit with sugar syrup if you want to help that, but they combine fairly quickly and one of those queens is gonna be killed. They're not gonna allow the other one to live. I mean, I know I say that with great conviction in my voice, but here's the thing. Um, it's rare to have two queens make it like that that are not related, that are from separate colonies. So, but the good news is you're going to get a double strength colony that's probably going to make it. So I hope that helps. Question number five comes from Dwayne in Neen, Wisconsin. N-E-E-N-H. Do the yellow jackets get varroa mites as the honeybees? Several people asked this question this week, and I think something must be going on about that. Varroa destructor mites, here's the good news. They are species specific, which means they feed on Apis mellifera exclusively. That is what the road destructor mites are on here in the United States. They don't go after bumblebees. They don't go after solitary bees, the bobs, the blue orchard bees, the mason bees. All of those are safe from the varroa destructor mite. 
And this, a lot of this has to do with reproduction and everything else, but anyway, that's the safe one. Now, the part of it that they're not safe from, and there was a study done by University of Vermont, uh, where honeybees that were infected with diseases spread by the varroa destructor mite were passing out some of those infections, some of those pathogens to native bees. And this is why some people get in an uproar about the honeybee, which is not native, and its impact, its potential negative impact on native bee species. So one of the things that was passed on was deformed wing virus. Sometimes you just see DWV, deformed wing virus, which is a pathogen that's a pathogen that's spread around by the varroa destructor mite, enters into the bees, and it's also kind of one of the indicators when you have an advanced infestation of varroa destructor mites on your beehive, it is not the only evidence that you've got varroa destructor mites, but if you see deformed wing virus and you see dead bees dragged out in the purple eye phase or whatever it happens to be on these landing boards early in the morning, examine them, look at their wings and stuff. You see these little shriveled wing nubs? Uh, first of all, the bees can chew them, so that's one thing. But if you've got fully developed bees that their wings are shriveled, and I see it more on drones than I see on worker bees, but it can be, you know, demonstrated on your worker bees also. But if you see that, you've got a real virus problem. So here's the thing, that's also been spread out to bumblebees on flowers. So that's not good. Here's the other thing, I dissected a yellow jacket wasp nest, and there was evidence on some of the wasps in there of deformed wing virus. So if you wanna see that, I'd be interested in your thoughts. I really hope that the bees, of course, wasps are raiding honeybee hives, they definitely would be taking advantage of dead and dying bees. So we see um, yellow jacket wasps on the ground in front of hives. And these are bees that are being cast out by resident bees. So maybe because they're sick, maybe they have deformed wing virus. If we think about all these connections, they drop that dead and dying drone or worker bee on the ground. Who comes, collects it, takes the thorax, gets the protein, takes it back, feeds its young with it. These wasps do. So... I don't know if there's a connection, I couldn't find it, but I found specimens when I did these dismantling stages of the hive, and there definitely seemed to be some kind of virus. Now, did it come from honeybees? I don't know, but it had deformed wings. So I'll put a link to that video on question number five. Check it out, tell me what you think too. So moving right along, question number six. Comes from Adam Oswald, that's the YouTube channel name. From 2140 to 2146, this is in observation of a drone on a late season swarm video. You can see a drone land on the board in the left of the frame, then crawl into the hive. What's that all about? Do drones swarm with hives? So I guess the better question, do drones swarm out with bees when they're bivouac? They sure do, they show up. Here's the other thing. Drones are opportunistic feeders. Drones get a pass. They land on landing boards of colonies that have nothing to do with that drone genetically, which is why drones can be bad. If it's a diseased drone, they can leapfrog from hive to hive to hive, be cared for and fed in that hive, and then continue their journey on to other hives, which means the drone can actually spread disease more so than any other bee. So anyway, was it attracted to the queen pheromone? They sure are. They fly by pheromones. They're really attracted to unmated queens or recently mated queens that are returning from their mating flight. So when they do that, they, they just follow in. There's a comet of drones chasing queens. So yeah, and drones will just fly up and land on clusters of bees on tree branches that they're not even related to. So... Was it a drone that swarmed with the original hive, or is it from a neighbor? A little late in this uh, year for nuptial flights, isn't it? So, not where I live. There are lots of drones still on the wing, and uh, I just recently looked at a swarm. It had plenty of drones. Not just that, while I was dealing with a swarm later, uh, drones were just flying up and joining it, so trying to get in. And guess what? They weren't stopped at the, at the newly established colony of bees, Drones were just showing up. It's kind of like you just moved in. You're just unpacking your food and resources. Your groceries are still in your car. And a neighbor shows up and asks you to fix a meal for him. These drones are just begging for food when they show up. And then they leave and go somewhere else. 
So yeah, drones seem to get a pass. They go everywhere. And this time of year, they're still around. But uh, some colonies are not feeding them and they're starting to kick them out. So question number seven comes from Jeff 5384. Again, that's a YouTube channel name. I've got both the insulated inner cover and the hive cover, and while both are very well made, quality of construction, I do not love all the venting, hence my interest in this video. You made this video about a year ago. Any comments you can provide on how your project has worked out? I've seen your reference, the insulated cover feeding shim in other videos, but haven't seen you talk about what has worked well and what you would do different, etc. Well, I can talk about, this was the cover image for today. That insulated inner cover is uh, a very effective tool in helping your bees survive winter. Insulated feeder shim, feeding opportunities above. I'm just going to go on and read the second paragraph here. Maybe I missed that. In which case, can you provide a link? Thanks. One question for you. The rapid rounds don't sit flush on the inner cover do the protrusion of the center hole on the rapid round. I've seen you use a spacer fashioned from a small board with a hole cut in it as an adapter. For this project, it seems that you let the foam provide the spacer. Comments or suggestions? Okay, there's a video which I will link to question number seven that uh, shows how I modify the B-Smart Designs insulated inner cover and provide a feeder shim around it using expansion foam. And that's what we're talking about. So first I'll address the inner cover. Some have protrusions through the bottom like this one does. You see it right there. Some do not. Most of mine do. Um, so these are the boards I'm talking about and that are referenced in this question. Three quarter inch pine board. We put this on here. And then this is the insulated foam insert for the B Smart Designs insulated inner cover. If you put this... Uh, protrusion here on that insulation by itself, it does sit flush. However, that's not how it's designed to work. The insulated inner cover, which I'm going to talk about here, um, has this little riser in the center that your bees come through to access the food and resources. This does not go inside that cover. In other words, they're too close in diameter, so you still need the shim to create that spacer so that you can accommodate that protrusion or you can find some way to cut that off by the way some people have bought these they have no protrusion in the middle but anyway you still need the spacer because they bump up and one won't go inside the other which in a perfect world it would so yes you still need that but um the thing about the venting this be smart designs and this is what i wrote all my notes on it here because i'm just going to use this for training um, this is designed to have this channel through the middle that allows you to set it up so that you can vent here. And I'm going to talk about a problem associated with that. And then of course there's an outside hole on the end. This channel lines up with that and it goes this way. So then you've got a hole in this riser and a channel through the insulation that leads to the outside. Here are some of the problems that people have been having with this hive because of the polystyrene insert. Ants get into the polystyrene, they chew it up, they excavate nest cavities, and then they occupy it. The other thing is sometimes your bees get up here and they'll chew the section around the cone because there's an opening right here. So I plug those openings. Now, what keeps ants from getting into your polystyrene? Well, in this case, we're talking about aluminum foil. So all I did was wrap aluminum foil around the cone. I tape it. Now here's the thing about bees and aluminum foil, which I think is pretty funny. Here's an opening here. It's plugged with aluminum foil. Ants will not chew through aluminum foil. Honeybees propolize it. That's pretty funny. So when this edge of aluminum foil is here by this entrance hole that you see on the bottom there, which is for the venting, which I never use anyway, so... Um, the bees propolize the aluminum foil right away. It's pretty funny. So it's just a curiosity. I put this in with the channel, the vent channel opposite. So it goes that way. Here's the entrance. So now this becomes a block there. If I did not close up 
this with a little piece of aluminum foil. I've also hot glued it in the past. I tried a lot of different things. Aluminum foil and tape works. So then when you put this in there, if you did not have an aluminum foil barrier, ants would go in here and just start chewing through your polystyrene insert. Very annoying. So just by putting aluminum foil in there, you stop that. The other thing is uh, you can also run a one and a quarter inch PVC pipe through the top and have a riser that goes right up into your feeder or whatever else kind of tank you've got to prevent your bees from getting out in here. Because I've also found out that if the bees have access to this polystyrene, they propolize it and in some cases they chew it themselves. So I'm going to keep the bees out of this. That's it for that part. So aluminum foil is a good block for that. Let me just drop my queen cage. And uh, you still need the shim. So that's it. They're still great. I still use them. And every one of those insulated inner covers I get, I don't just put it on the way it is. I put a medium super on it. You could get away with a shallow super because even these are only two inches tall. But you're adding to that if you have to put a shim on it. So you can cut away the cone. But if you give your bees access to that polystyrene insert or if ants have access to it, then they do chew it. So, and they propolize it in some cases or they continue to excavate it. So, aluminum foil stops that. And the good part is they propolize the aluminum foil and propolis is good stuff. So that's that. Moving on, question number eight. Barry from Ivy Bridge, United Kingdom. Says I have a lay-ins hive, which was cut in half before I got it. Each half is closed off at both ends. So effectively I have two hives. I joined them back together for convenience and have my first colony, which is thriving, exclamation point. The hive is in an orchard, which is why they did so well, arriving in early June and having a sunny month before two months of rain. I checked them for the first time last week and they already are drawing comb on the 14th frame. I'm now waiting for a sunny day to do the final inspection. As there was a lot of uncapped honey, I wanted to give them a chance to cap. I live 30 miles from the orchard, so I have a cunning plan to run past you. The plan is to take the extra honey and reduce the frames down to winter levels. After extracting the honey, I want to put the now empty comb into the other end of the hive to be cleaned out. Hopefully my own bees ready for next year. Is it okay to leave drawn comb in the hive? Okay. So, and I don't know what a winter is like there. So, but I will address it for here because sure, it would be convenient if we could just keep the extra frames that are not utilized right now for wintering and store them inside the hive. But I highly recommend you don't. And here's why. One of the reasons that we talk about packing down the hives. So where I live, the winters are pretty severe. I'm in the snow belt. Uh, my grandson and I are removing all extra space. So if we had drawn comb uh, that we had harvested and we just wanted to put it inside the hive for a placeholder, whether that's a long Langstroth or a Lands, uh, any horizontal hive configuration, anytime we have space, that's just space. And that's what comb that is not filled is. So then we want to get rid of that. I want all the space in the hive to be occupied by food and resources. And I want it to be sized for the size of the colony that occupies the hive. That's why we end up with a deep and a medium for the larger ones. The horizontal hives are also, we're packing those down this week. And by that, I mean, we have uh, one long Langstroth hive that has 20 full frames in it. So we're going to be assessing the comb that's full of brood. It's an also, it's an opportunity to retire old comb if it's empty and there's no brood in it and it's really dark. I try to cycle that out about every five years. So no comb older than five years in brood. And then we pull out any partial frames of honey and we pack down to nothing but full frames of honey. So, um, I don't like to leave a bunch of unoccupied space that the bees will not move into you offer that then to 
critters that might be eating it. So you might have mice get in there. You might have um, wax worms. So the wax moth might lay in there. And so we have areas that the bees are not necessarily going to be policing. And then because it's an empty space, it also becomes an area where on really warm days following a really cold night, for example, you would get a lot of condensation and potentially additional mold in areas where the bees, again, are not occupying the space. They're not warming it. They're not keeping it clean. So I recommend always storing empty frames, empty comb in uh, totes or something that will protect it from being bothered by pests. So even in storage, mice will move in and chew comb if it's got any kind of sweetener left on it. So any honey residue that's on it, we want to get that out too uh, because we don't want pests, again, to be attracted by that. And so you don't want your you know, wax moth to lay eggs and then have wax worms. Wax worms are incredible consumers. They'll even chew the wood. So let's not offer them anything for that. But additional space is not in use for the bees. Um, I would put them in storage instead, separate from the hive. And then in spring, add them to whatever hives need it, as needed. So that's my response to that. Question number nine comes from Shane, Cootstown, Pennsylvania. I'm a first-year beekeeper in eastern PA with two colonies. Both are double deeps with a medium super separated by queen excluder. Last month, I had planned to extract the honey from the supers, which had three or four frames each that were only, now this is key, they were only about 50% capped. I tested the honey and found that it was not ready, 21% on my refractometer. So for those of you who don't know, a refractometer gives you the water percentage of your honey and 21%. That honey uh, has too much water and therefore could ferment. I considered some options, including freezing until next year, open feeding the frames to clean them out, drying them out with fans or a dehumidifier, or putting them back on the hives to see if the bees would finish packing the frames. I spoke with a local beekeeper, and of course, follow your channel. The local beekeeper reinforced your content, indicating that there is a strong fall flow in this area. So I put the supers back on. I also replaced the completely undrawn frames with better comb. Today, September the 16th, about two weeks later, I opened the hives and was surprised to find that the supers have less honey than they did before. In addition to there being less honey, I found that the bees packed virtually nothing into the better comb frames I added to the supers. Better comb did work well for me establishing the colony in spring but does not seem to be interesting to the bees at this time. I suspect that the bees have been feeding on the honey in the upper frames or moving it down to the second brood box, and I've concluded that I will not be extracting any honey this year. I have read that I can refeed the honey to the colony by putting a standard inner cover between the super and the brood chamber because the bees in the colony will not consider the comb on the other side of the inner cover opening to be part of the colony, and so they will essentially have a private robbing party. I'm giving this a try, but I was wondering if you had any opinions about the approach. I was honestly expecting to see those supers get packed out over the month based on the landing board activity, but now I'm most concerned with ensuring that the brood chambers are well prepared for the winter ahead. So here's the thing, and this is why a lot of new, new keepers um, get frustrated because they'll do an inspection, the hive will be really heavy. And then they'll be pulling frames and there's uncapped comb in there and it's full of nectar, full of honey. And they pull them out and they're super heavy. And then just a couple of days later, they'll go out and now it's, as described, half of what it was. And it looks like they're consuming a lot of it. But let's not forget that wet honey is being dried. And when it's being dried, it's being concentrated. And when they're concentrating it, they often tend to move it from cell to cell. And they're drying it when they do this trophallaxis, when they're passing it back and forth, tongue to tongue. They're adding enzymes to it. They're drying it down and they're condensing it. So from nectar to honey, we can go from 10 frames of nectar, just hypothetical. And then when that's finished honey, that would occupy only five frames. So what's really potentially happening is that they're drying it down and concentrating it and finishing it off. 
So it can seem like they're consuming more than they are. Although, when we get these cold nights or rainy periods and things like that, the bees consume the open cells first. So the high water content honey gets consumed first. Now, one of the mentions here is that you could take wet honey and put it in a freezer and keep it from fermenting. Absolutely true. So you could take honey that wasn't properly dried. And if you have a lots of freezer space or heaven forbid, you're, or you're blessed with one of those really large walk-in freezers, you could put supers on racks and bring them right in there and they will not crystallize. They will not ferment and you arrest all of the degradation of the honey while it's in that freezer. So you could do that. Um, so the other thing is, there's just a lot going on this time of year for me personally. So now we're just talking about my personal preference and uh, I don't want to store a bunch of honey. So what I do is leave it on uh, the hive and let the bees consume it. And then what I'm looking at, partial frames. So if I have a, a frame that's a third full and I'm in pack down mode, it's being pulled. If I have a super that's up above that has some frames that are wall to wall honey, in other words, the whole frame's capped front and back. And I look down below and I've got, you know, a frame that's partially full. I'll pull the partially full one and replace it with the full one. And that's because we're maximizing what the bees are going to have immediate to their vicinity inside the hive going into winter. And then we'll pull the partials and we'll just extract those. So me personally, I don't have the freezer space. So I would pull those partial frames and especially when we're packing down and I would go ahead and put them and use fans and I use a dehumidifier and just a fan on the dehumidifier running uh, in an enclosed area gets that up to in the 90s and also the air movement alone will continue to dry out the honey. So it goes down by about a percentage a day. So based on this description, had that been put in there three days later, you would have, you know, honey that's under 19% moisture. So it would be then workable. Plus that 90 degrees that it's warmed up to uh, is a perfect extraction temperature too. So no matter what your extraction process is, it's going to help it along. So you just have a lot of options, but one of the considerations is that they're not really um, necessarily consuming it all. They're drying it down. And that's why they need lots of space. The other thing is they've stopped building new comb and they've also, um, they're not going to work up better comb when you put that in there, unless it's all they have. But if they've already got drawn frames and things like that, and it's an established colony and everything, then they're, they're good to go. So the other thing is about this approach of putting in an inner cover and then putting that box on top of it, letting the bees rob it out. Uh, that actually works. It's no different really than putting it right back on the hive without the inner cover and letting them just clean it up. And then they'll be out of it. Because here's the thing, when we put frames up in an upper space, it's I, I almost don't see the benefit of having the inner cover under it unless what we're trying to do is let the bees seal those joints up with propolis while we still have some warm days ahead of us. Because that's another part of this packing down, configuration changing this time of year. We need to make sure that the boxes, the inner covers and things like that are marrying up really well and that we're leaving the bees enough warm days ahead to use propolis to reseal the joints and fix the damage that we cause every time we go into the hive. So that's probably a benefit to having it on top of the inner cover. And I don't see it as a problem as a cleanup opportunity because they're definitely going to do that. And they're not going to build new infrastructure up there because it's too late in the year. So, but here's a good thing for Shane. I hope that you'll let us know what you do and how it worked so that if there's some new ground here to be covered, uh, we will know and we can share it to uh, those who are also trying to figure out what to do in a similar circumstance. So question number 10 comes along here from Terry, Nebraska City, Nebraska. There are a lot of people on YouTube talking about feeding bananas to bees. They say there are studies saying bees produce more winter brood feeding bananas instead of sugar syrup. What are your opinions on this? Okay, everyone has opinions. So I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at it. Bananas. It's just so easy to say that that's bananas. I know that there are people that are very interested in bananas and putting them in their hives. This has been around for years. Um, and uh, they'll run down an entire list of all the ingredients of a banana. And that when a banana is um, 
about to spoil. So banana bread candidate, banana. Um, here's the thing, uh, should you put it inside your beehive? So the interesting part is I, you know, I can have my half-baked opinion about it, but uh, my thinking is always, would I find a banana inside a beehive? And if I did put something inside a beehive, whether the bees wanted it or not, would they appear to consume it? They would because they have to dismantle it. They have to get rid of it. They have to get it out of there. Bananas are sweet. So if you eat bananas, you know that they're sweet. The sugars are concentrated as the banana degrades. I'm not a food science guy, but you know, it gets gushy and pretty disgusting. So here's the, here's the good part about that is uh, Kim Flottam. This guy is a legend in beekeeping and they have a, um, they have an online interview series where they talk about stuff that goes on with bees and bee nutrition and things like that is part of it. So they invited a master beekeeper on to talk about what else? Bananas. So um, part of her, when you go through master beekeeper programs, you have to do research and write papers. It's one of the things that you do as depending on where you're getting it, but uh, you have to write these papers, do research and find supporting science. So the guest for that particular interview was dealing with the bananas and the nutrition. And then of course, the potential benefits of feeding your bees bananas. So there again, all the key parts, you know, it can't be a fresh banana right off a tree and so forth. But uh, when you really distill it down to what the benefits of the banana were inside the hive for these bees. These were bees in the study, the only ones that show that it was positive. And I realize I'm talking about one study. Maybe there's more studies out there. Google it. Go to Google Scholar and find out what else is going on. But um, bees, the comparison was bees that were desperate in a dearth, in decline, with very low resources available to them. So the banana was resuscitating a colony that otherwise would have been in profound decline due to a lack of nutrition in the area, a profound dearth. So in absence of everything else, the banana was a great choice. Okay, so there was some evidence that the banana benefited the bees if the bees were in a situation where the environment was not providing what they needed to survive. And then after the whole discussion was over, Kim Flottam said he would not personally put bananas in there. And the reason that he cited was we already have uh, feeding systems. We have patties that provide if you need protein, if, if you're trying to continue the brood production in a colony, for example, because the reference is uh, that it produces more winter brood. Well, the winter brood comes from also a protein source as well. So is that going to stimulate that? Or are we just giving them energy? And it is, is it in the absence of everything else? So what I'm really saying in my response to this is, consider all the angles. What was the situation with the colony that benefited from the banana? And how does that compare to colonies that are otherwise healthy or have access to good resources is the banana a resuscitation move or is it really a boost at a time when bees even have access to other things? So the way it was presented was that it's kind of a resuscitation for a colony that's in trouble and in an environmental situation where it can't provide for itself. So in that way, it seemed to work. Kim Flottam said he would not use that because other resources are already out there um, that we know are 100% good for your bees. So the other thing is, you know, for me personally, I, I'm not going to be in a situation where I would need to put a banana in there. So, and this is ignoring any other discussion about whether the smell of bananas is going to make your bees defensive. I don't think that's the case because their pheromones are very specific. Alarm pheromones, I understand, can smell like bananas, uh, but that doesn't mean that if you bring a banana there, that uh, you're gonna suddenly be attacked because their alarm pheromones are far more complex than just the scent of the banana. But I'm gonna side with uh, Kim Flottam that it's not necessary because you have other resources. And then there were a lot of people chiming in that live where bananas are. And in other words, in the environment, because it's the other side of, of the house and the way of thinking about it. If a bee 
foraging had access to bananas in an environment that already provides the resources that the bee needs, would they go to these bananas that even are spoiling instead of other resources that the bees normally use, which come from floral resources? So then the answer from them, the people that live on banana plantations, were saying bees were ignoring their bananas. So it's up in the air. It's a hard neutral. So for me, I'm just defaulting to Kim Flottam's discussion. But look up his podcast. And if you want to hear that discussion, you could actually listen to the entire research and see what the pros and cons were, what the benefits actually were, and how the parameters of that research were put together. And then make your own decision about it. But uh, that's pretty much it. So... Question number 11, David from Amarillo, Texas, do you ever harvest your flow frames at night? I let a jar overfill recently and oh boy, what a mess. Now all the hives are patrolling the area behind the honey disaster hive and getting up in the equipment even before I turn the key. Bees remember. Yes, they do. So this is the last question of the day. So I'm going to blend it right into my close out fluff section here because this deals with this. Uh, my grandson's going to be here in less than an hour. He's going to have his bee suit on and we're going to be out there working on our bees. We're in the middle of our final nectar flow. So they probably have two weeks of nectar in the environment. And to answer this question, the simple uh, answer to David is, yeah, you could run flow hives at night because we're not pulling hives apart. In fact, it's probably the only hive design where you can take honey away at night when it's a little cooler. And here's why. We're not uncovering the hive. We're not pulling the super off. We're not getting down into it and we're not smoking the bees. If you did that at night, you're in a pickle because bees that can't see crawl on everything, including you. They crawl on the ground. They'll come up your pant legs. Um, I'd like to see these people that wear shorts and sneakers and fuzzy socks go out at night and try to work their bees because they would be covered in bees. Um, the other thing is the lighting that you use at night. Amber light, like darkroom light, or red lamps. And don't be holding them. Set them up on a post, put them on a clamp, aim it at the work that you're doing. So, but a flow hive could easily be tended to at night and uh, because if you've already started robbing, and they see a white light, you're gonna get bees. So the red lights, keep it low key. And yes, you can extract honey from a flow frame at night. I think that's totally workable. So the other thing is the reason that we are doing our packing down and our honey removal, our extraction right now, is because they still are in a state of contentment. So the bees are out there, they're still getting resources, they're very active. We're not looking at a thousand bees on a landing board with nothing to do and uh, looking at a dried up landscape where there's no more flower out there. There are no floral resources for the bees. So we've got Maximilians, we've got Cosmos, we've got Goldenrod still. Asters are out there. Asters are smelling terrible. Um, and so it, there's a lot of resources still out there for the bees. This is a great time to work the hives because when we pull them apart, we're not going to kick off a robbing frenzy. Now, Let's move this into the second week of October and start pulling apart beehives. Any disruption of honey in a hive at the end of the year, when there are no more resources out there, you are inviting a calamity. And that is because any honey that gets exposed to the air, we have scouts that are investigating every nook and cranny at every level within you know a mile of the beehive. So... Anytime you, you gouge, you know, your a honey frame with a hive tool and it drips honey, you're going to draw the attention of other bees. And once they start feeding on that hive, you may not even be able to finish working it because the robbing frenzy will just be intense. That's why I always do my honey removal, my honey extraction with at least two weeks left of a nectar flow because I don't want to put a colony in jeopardy. And for the same reasons that David describes here, once they know there's a source of honey, once they get a taste of it and they zip back to their hive, and remember those foragers I talked about before, they waste no time. 
They unload their cargo, they get the interest of a whole bunch of other foragers that are following them on the dance floor, and they're all coming back, and then it's exponential. So it's that pyramid. You know, the one scout gets back, and now we've got 20 and 40, 60, 200, 300, and now we've got a colony in jeopardy because they'll even overrun the landing board. And even when you close it up, they're just intense and they go after every little opening. And if they can overwhelm, overwhelm the guard bees on the landing board and get past them and start fighting and killing them off or whatever happens when they get entangled with them, it's like, you know, Black Friday at a Walmart when all these people rush in and the people can barely hold the doors. You can't stop them. You put them in jeopardy. So, flow hive, very easy. It's a good thing. And by the way, when they do leak, once they know it's back there, and this includes the wasps, the yellow jacket wasps are ridiculous too. So I have that big wasp nest that I've been monitoring and it is growing really fast. I'm going to have to do something about that coming up. And guess what I'm going to use? I'm going to use my uh, everything bee vac and I'm going to take apart that wasp nest because it's on the side of a house right next to a bedroom window and it's getting big. So for those of you who didn't see that, there's a video about it. I'm going to make a video of the removal. So we're going to see what's in there. And since that's also the base of operations for wasp raids on my apiary, i uh, going to have to take them out. Sorry. So that's what's going on here. Have your robin screens handy if you need them. Reduce entrances. You will not necessarily be reducing their ability to dry the honey. Screen bottom boards are good as long as it's enclosed underneath because even the smells for a screen bottom board that's open will attract these robbers and get them intense on the bottom of your hive. Um, and of course, do what you do. And if you do something that works, no reason to change that I can think of. So I wanna thank you for spending some of your time with me here today and I hope you learned something new and I hope that uh, the end of 2023 is looking good for your bees. Things are looking good here. So thanks for watching, have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.